totally keeping us on track. Okay. And so now you're live. We are live. Excellent. Well, welcome, Baroness Vivian. I am delighted to be talking to you today. I am delighted to be here. <laughs> so it looks like oh, we have two folks watching already. Um Oh, I am sorry. I should also introduce. I am Baroness Jimena from Terra Pimeria. Baroness Vivian, um, Order of the Pelican, is um, from Three Mountains, just to the north of us. And we have had multiple conversations over the last couple of years about fibery related things. And uh, the welt, wet felting is something that you mentioned in passing. And I dive down that rabbit hole, and our next conversation, I believe, was something like blizzardy, 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 blizzardy. <laughs> that, that is accurate. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm very excited. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, it's me. It happens. Um, but yeah, so I'm delighted to have to have you talking to us about this today. Um, and so we'll go ahead and yeah. Um, don't know. I should have asked this before someone put us live. Uh, <laughs> um, the format of the class. Um, did you want me to interject with questions or just? We do. Here? Yes. Okay. If people have questions, please um, let me know. Uh, I'm on the camera in front of me. Um, it won't show me comments. So if people have questions, let me know. And I'm happy to answer them in, in context. Excellent. So we um, we have for the folks watching on either YouTube or Facebook, any comments that you make automatically feed through into our studio so we can we can share the questions as they come across. And yeah, anyone with questions, please let us know. And uh, with that, I will turn over to the official uh, the official learning part of today. OK, uh, so I am going to I'm gonna give you a little context for the historical part. Um, and then I'm going to show you how to do wet felting. So just so you have context for what I'm gonna be talking about, um, I made, I went down this rabbit hole because I wanted to make Scythian hats. So they're super cute and warm and um, my original interest and frankly still my obsession is um, all of the shiny things that go on Scythian stuff. And um, at the beginning of COVID, I wanted to go do a Scythian hat beginning to end. Just once, I wanted to make every part of it beginning to end. Um, and that led me down this felting rabbit hole that I've fallen down that was never an intended hobby. That is now a thing that I can talk for hours about and will tell people they should tell me when they're bored of the topic, I like it so much. So um, this, is, this is the kind of um, hat that I originally started with and I'm gonna, I'll talk about this as we go through, but so for context, this is a uh, wool felt, um, and I'm gonna show you how to make it and talk about the historical context for it. So my original interest was, like I said, the Scythians, um, and I wanted to do a Scythian hat beginning to end. So the Scythians, just for anybody who's not familiar, it's a sort of broad term for a whole bunch of people that live on the steppes um, in around Russia, China between those two large areas. And uh, it's about a thousand years of history. Uh, the peoples who lived in that region at this time, they didn't have a written language. So we don't have any written records of their own. The only rec written records we have are from, um, I can't even really say contemporaries. Uh, usually they're people who were alive a couple of hundred years or more after the Scythians had transitioned into other cultures and um, and peoples and tribes. Um, so, and hmm. like many people who wrote about things as authorities on things that happened hundreds of years before they um, lived and didn't have any written records of their own, they tend to have some inherent bias. So my, right? <laughs> I'm looking at you Victorians. Oh, um, I have a whole rant about the Victorians. <laughs> um, I'm sure most of us do if you get into some of these rabbit holes in history. Yeah. So, um, sorry, the Victorians will actually derail me. Um, <laughs> so that's just for context when and where they were. They were uh, steppes nomads. So um, they did move their um, 
encampments, their, their living situations were mobile. That doesn't mean they moved every day. It meant that they often would follow their herds. So there'd be seasonal moves. Um, and it varied a lot. The amount of moving they did varied a lot with the kind of herds they had, which part of the region they were living in. So the climate and the weather and um, how plants were growing would impact how often and how far they'd move. So all of those things mean that they were very pragmatic people because the only way you can thrive in a circumstance like that is to be really pragmatic and practical about a lot of things. Um, and it impacts your material culture and your material culture, all the, the physical objects of life. Um, those are the artifacts that we actually have from the Scythians. They had burials called kurgans, often called kurgans. Um, and because they're up in those steps where it's super cold, um, a lot of the things got preserved really well, but the fibers didn't survive their 3000 years of being frozen real well. So we have pieces of things. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them are really cool pieces, but they're generally pieces. So we know tiny snapshots of things, but unlike like, for example, Egyptian culture, we have lots and lots of things that we have um, their writings, we have their art, we have their material culture, and we have lots and lots of contemporaries, actual contemporaries who interacted with them and wrote about them. So we have all of that context. We don't have that for the Scythians in a lot of cases. So we have these tiny pieces and we're, when you get into the experimental archeology, span you try to figure out how they do it. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about tonight has to do with that pragmatic aspect because for felt, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, it's very pragmatic craft. It's not complicated. Um, when you talk to modern artisans about felting, mm -hmm. they tend to overcomplicate it for the basic process. So they're often going for like an, a modern artist is going for a very specific um, effect or a color or a texture that they want instead of the functional piece of it, which is at its core, super basic. So with all of that as context, can I ask show you how to make felt? Yep. Do we have a question? Yeah. Can I ask a quick derailing yeah. question? Not super yeah. derailing, but so you mentioned that they um, they had different types of herds. Is there archaeological evidence of the different fiber types they were using? Is it primarily sheep? Do we have yak? I mean, like, what are do do we know? So what a fabulous, yeah, totally a derailing question. Um, okay, so <laughs> specific to sheep. Um, the sheep, they definitely had sheep. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time of the Scythians, we as a human race had mm -hmm. um, bred sheep to be wool sheep or meat sheep. So they were distinct by the time the Scythians and actually long before the Scythians, they were distinct mm -hmm. types. So you would, you would breed one kind of herd would be for your meat, one kind would be for the wool that you harvest. So, and those basic kinds of sheep, the wool that was coming off the wool sheep by the time of the Scythians was pretty similar to our modern day sheep. There's not mm -hmm. any fundamental difference. There's variety between the species. So you have some sheep that were bred for longer wool or shorter wool or thicker wool because they were bred at like higher altitudes. Mm -hmm. um, but when you actually use it for felting, you end up with fibers that are basically the same in their, um, in their physics. Mm -hmm. And by the time of the Scythians, you had um, white wool. So originally sheep were not white. So by the time you get to them, you have white and black and brown. Um, mostly people were breeding for white sheep because you can dye it. So, I mean, it's a, it's a very human thing across a lot of cultures. So that's the sheep part. We know about those. And um, we do have evidence that for the Scythians, they did get their sheep, not only from their own herds, but from the herds for thousands of miles around them because they've run in a couple of places, um, DNA checks on what they've got and they found one of the kinds of sheep that they had came from the Mediterranean. Oh my goodness. Scythians were all the way um, into the steppes. So yeah, it's, I love so it. they had access to all of that. Um, I also, I have reference to um, camel and goat, both being used in the research that I've found. Um, I've also been told that they have camel and I really want to use camel. Uh, it felt differently and it's, really cool looking and my assumption is if we know they had access to camels mm -hmm. um 
my assumption is if they had access to it and it felt they would have used it because it's practical and they did mix fibers to get different effects in the felt. So we know all of that. Um, I haven't seen the like archeological dig that shows me a camel artifact, a camel felt artifact. I'm sure they exist. Um, my personal rabbit hole has been going down um, sheep's wool creation because that's the easy thing to access. Oh, and I didn't, in my intro, I didn't give this as um, part of my um, spiel at the beginning. I'm gonna talk about the historical context and how they did it in period. And I'm gonna show you how to do it modern day, very inexpensively and very pragmatically, because I think this is a super fun, easy way to get into um, experimental archeology span and SCA crafts. Um, it doesn't have to cost a fortune and it doesn't have to be complicated. If you like it, I will also show you the things that can go down those more expensive, more complicated rabbit holes, but you don't have to use them to make this a thing you can do and use, so. Yeah. Did that answer all of your rabbit hole and introduce a new one? That was fabulous. Yeah. And and I will say, I know that one of the one of the rab the way you hooked me into this with the rabbit hole was telling me to go to go Google uh was it Pakistani rug makers? There was there was a specific yeah, and that sent me down to, into the modern the modern descendants of this process, which is one yeah. of the things that just makes me delighted about the so whole thing. <laughs> all of this is really use so the felt uh wool felt in particular um it's super useful um it's really durable it can be made very very pretty you can make all kinds of colors you can make fabric from it that you can make hats out of um and rugs that will list will last for <clears throat> thousands of years because we have rugs from the scythians fragments of it that are thousands of years old and still amazingly colored yeah. so yeah it's it's a whole thing it is okay well i will uh, underrail <laughs> um so let me show you what Robo looks like so when i started i was starting at the beginning of covid mm -hmm. and i wanted here's my sample um i wanted to make this accessible um which is to say inexpensive and easy to do in people's homes because we were going to be locked in for two years so what I did was um, I found some fiber artists who had raw unprocessed wool at their house that they weren't gonna use anymore. And I just asked them if I could have it because they were like cleaning out the garage. If you come pick it up, I'll give it to you. So the first thing I got was a garbage bag of wool and I'd never used wool before. I'd never done felting um, and I tried to make it into felt. And the first thing, this is, this is a sample of it. So um, you can see it's got lots of stuff in it. This is, in hindsight, I didn't know this at the time, this is meat wool. So this is off of a sheep that was bred for meat, not for its wool. So if you're getting stuff from a sheep bred for its wool, um, it will be groomed and washed, and then it'll get a coat, like an actual outdoor coat put over its, um, coat yeah we use that word to mean too many things in this context uh they get a co cloth covering of their wool coats while it dries and then when it's dry and clean then they shear the sheep so what comes off the sheep is clean mm -hmm. it still has uh lanolin in it and lanolin is um it's often in like hand lotion it's um it's uh water resistant so you'll find like if you if you buy a sweater in like from Ireland or anywhere like that where they they wear those sweaters out in the weather, they smell like sheep because they don't wash the linen all and off before they use them. So it's this great like lubricating soft um, uh, weather resistant thing that's in there. So they don't take it off, but they do make sure it's clean. With a meat wool, um, <laughs> sheep are filthy and stupid. And I am not saying that with prejudice. I They are not intelligent animals and um, their wool has that lanolin on it and it's the wool itself is long and kinky and things get caught in it. So they're filthy, they just are. So the wool sheep, they shear them and then they get rid of the, uh, the wool. Mm -hmm. There's not usually a big market for it because um, they're making it for the meat. So you can often get it for free because they're just gonna get rid of it. Um, and that's what I got. 
turned out I also had a piece that, um, and again, didn't know this, that lanolin I was talking about, uh, if it sits on the wool in a garbage bag in somebody's garage for two years, it will turn into something that's a lot like beeswax. Uh -oh. It's hard and sticky. Um, makes it hard to work with, so you have to wash it out. So here's, here's the first place where the um, modern way to do this differs from what you would do in period. So for modern day, Neat wool, I got a whole bunch of it free. I'm still working on the, I haven't, I haven't bought any giant bags of wool yet. I'm still working through the meat wool that I was given. Um, and it takes a little extra work to get it cleaned, but it's basically can be found for free um, and it works. There's nothing wrong with using it for felt. It works just like anything else does. Um, but because it's filthy like this and it's occasionally sticky, um, I wash it. And I use this really complicated thing called Dawn soap. Uh, genuinely, this is the stuff. This is my fancy bottle because it's pretty, but it's it's Dawn um, dish soap. It's the stuff you get at the grocery store, and most of us use on our dishes. It's a really innocuous kind of dish soap, so it's just easy on. It's gentle on the wool. So the way you wash wool is you take room temperature water. You don't want hot water. You want room temperature water. And um, you mix in the soap and then you put in the wool and you let it soak and you kind of agitate it very gently, mm -hmm. let it soak. And then you pull the wool out and then you press squeeze it. You never twist it because if you twist it, you start the felting process because you're giving it friction. Um, and you keep doing that until the water's clean. So when it turns into something that looks more like this, so this is, you can see that's that's the difference between washed and unwashed wool. So that's there we go. You're giving me hope for my for my porch hoard as well. <laughs> oh yeah, it's it's always salvageable. There is a caveat. So I mentioned sheep being filthy. Um, if anybody's familiar with sheep, you'll know that when their wool gets really long, their sheep droppings get caught in their wool. Mm, yes. So when you get wool from it, well, from any sheep. Um, it is often shaved off at the same time as the rest of the wool is. It's usually shaved off like first because the people doing the shaving don't want to deal with it either. So they'll shave that off first and toss it away. You can use that. You absolutely can. It involves fermenting it in your backyard and it will literally ferment away. Um, it smells so bad. The descriptions alone from people who have done it have talked me out of wanting to try it. It's doable. It, you put it in a tub, you put it in your backyard, you put a cover on it with a bunch of water and you kind of walk away and just let it cook and ferment. And then you come back and do it again if it needs to after it's rinsed and that makes it usable. I'm so tempted. I know that I shouldn't be because I know it is disgusting and horrifying, but at the same time, I-, I It's I fascinating, haven't... right? <laughs> it's totally fascinating. And the only thing keeping me from doing it is, I'm, I live in a city, so even if I put it in my backyard, I don't think I can get away, far enough away from my house to not stink the house and have it be far enough away from my neighbor's house that it wouldn't stink up one of their houses. So we can put it in the middle, we can put it in the middle of the tree field. Anyway, we'll discuss yeah. that later. <laughs> right. So it can be done. Um, there's, I, so I have not encountered any circumstance of wool that doesn't make it salvageable for um, use for felting. So these pieces that I worked with, they they were, it's called skirting. They were skirted. So all of the things with droppings were not included in the bag. So I just got dirty stuff. Um, so after you've washed it, if you need to, if after you've washed it, um, then you start combing out the pieces. In period, um, I don't think they would have washed any of this. So I think what they would have done is they... And we have modern, um, in the same region, people using it the same way modernly. Mm -hmm. It's a big village activity. You shave all the sheep, all of the wool gets put down in a giant pile. Um, the next day, if there's lots of sheep to shear and you're doing it the next day, the next day you spread it all out on the ground and then you take two sticks, two just long rod sticks that you pull off of a tree, they're not fancy tools. And you literally spend hours hitting it just like a drum. 
and you work back and forth across this pile of fiber. And what that does is knock the largest pieces of um, organic matter or vegetal matter off of this and it all sort of filters down to the bottom till it hits the ground. Mm -hmm. um, it also loosens the fibers up and makes it easier to felt. And I've seen a bunch of videos of it. It's effective. I've tried it. It isn't particularly effective for small batches of wool. It seems to require like three or four inches of wool. It's like the bounce of the wool has something to do with how well it works. Mm -hmm. So I don't do it like when I'm working in my house with a small batch, I, I don't do it that way because it's it doesn't seem to be as effective. Um, but because they do all of those things, they don't wash the wool. It keeps all the lanolin. Um, they spend literally all day hitting it with sticks until all of this these pieces come out um, and then they turn it into felt. So when I talk about um, the combing and it's it's because we're using things that be accessible to us. So um, after you wash it, um, you can hit it with sticks for hours to knock all of this stuff out if you want to. Um, you can also comb it. So the <laughs> these are bee cappers. These are what you use to take the uh, wax off the top of beehives to get at the honey underneath. They run about $5 on any famous online supply site. Um, they have, there's a place here for your, no, going the wrong way, for your thumb and it's, it actually fits my grip pretty nicely. So it's, it's pretty ergonomic. This is what I recommend people start with when they do this, because this is a $5 investment. If That's you want so to do, Sorry. I bought that? the fancy Ashford combs. Like that is, I yeah. wish I knew about that 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, and because I started doing this during the, during COVID lockdown, I'm sure, well, I know that drove the prices of things up a lot. Um, but it meant that the period style combs, like Viking style combs, because the Vikings did this too. They mm -hmm. made felt, obviously. Um, they used combs and they're, you know, made of wood the comb concept is kind of universal. This is a basic universal tool. So it's some kind of metal or wood tine with, uh, there, can you see that? It's just got small spaces between it. It's basically uh -huh. just a fancy fork. Um, the bee cappers are sharp in a way that most of the other appliances aren't. So you can, if you do the bee cappers, use some sandpaper, make this dull because it doesn't need to be sharp. And if you leave it sharp, you will need band-aids. Ask me how I know. Um, it's not so a project is, if you don't believe on it. Right. Yeah. And unfortunately that does affect the dye later if you don't want it to be brown. Um, ask me how I know that one too. So um, these are, these are the accessibility thing. These are the easy way to get into the hobby for uh, low cost and it's pretty ergonomic. So it's not um, hard on your, harder on your hands than um, a lot of other hobbies are to use these. And um, let me show you, grab, oh, here we go. So this is a piece of um, raw wool. It's been washed, mm -hmm. but it's um, still got stuff in it. So what you do is um, grab a piece. You just kind of gently pull, because you want to pull the fibers apart. You don't, you don't want to break them. So you don't want to yank on them and break fibers. So what you do is you kind of put it through and pull, and you just kind of gently do that. And you can see there's little bits that are flying off. Those are the little bits of grass and things that are still in the wool. So you just kind of pull it along just gently. And my cat's on the other side of the room giving me commentary. Um, <laughs> so then once you've got it on, so you've got this mass on here, right? Then you take your other one. And this is, this is a Viking style um, mm -hmm. process that I'm showing you because this is an easy accessible way. Um, then you sort of pull it through like that and you're just kind of combing it off and I'm not yanking on it. I'm separating. I'm just pulling until it separates. So the longer I go, the fluffier it is. And I just keep going until I can't catch any more from the first comb. Mm -hmm. And what's left here, these are shorter fibers. You'll get the occasional longer one caught in, but these are short fibers. These will work for felting. 
um, but you'll have to work harder for it because uh -huh. those, those fibers are just shorter. So depending on how stubborn I'm being, um, I'll put these aside and use them for stuffing and something later. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm being really stubborn, I'll keep cleaning and I'll keep all the little fibers in and felt it all together. Um, it makes a coarser felt at the end because you got smaller fibers. It, it's just a little bit, um, it's not as soft because you've got yeah. more fiber ends. So you, se you can separate them out that way. So this is what we started with. See, it's all, you can see that. And this is, that's just going through the comb one time. It's all fluffy. So the fibers are all separated out. Um, so the Scythians specifically wouldn't probably have done this. I can't find anything that says they had um, wool combs. Uh -huh. uh, they probably did the stick thing where they just beat it with sticks. Uh, there's also some things regionally where they use a thing that looks like a bow, like a bow and arrow bow. And they put yeah. the string on the arc, they put the string down and they hit it with a hammer to make it twang and it vibrates the fibers and separates out. But yeah. again, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't tried it yet because I'm not going to use my Scythian bow for that because I'm not going to swing a hammer on my Scythian bow. Um, so I need to build one and try it. But I also don't have any direct evidence that the Scythians did that style because mm -hmm. we don't have a grave find that I've found that looks like one of those. They may not have shown up though. Even if they had them, it right. may have looked like the remains of a bow because it's a wooden bow shaped thing with a string on it 3000 years later. And we know that the Scythians really liked their bows. That's a pivotal part of their culture. So it, it would be really easy to assume that it was the same thing which is all to say, um, the other thing you can do is if you, this is what I do when I'm sitting in front of a movie and I'm doing a small batch of wool because the stick thing works when it's a big batch. I don't do big enough batches often. I do enough for like a hat or a piece pair of boots at a time. Mm -hmm. It's not enough for the stick thing to be effective. So I use these. Um, the fancy ones, you can buy them online. There's a whole bunch of varieties. They are essentially just fancy forks. So the different varieties turn into a modern day, what your preference is. Um, yeah, and I, I like, I think the ergonomics on these are better. I like the grip on them better than I like the wooden ones. Um, so there's that. And the other thing you can do, um, you can use a fork from your kitchen. You don't have to buy anything. You can just use a kitchen fork because it's just tines. Yeah, it works the same way. Um, you can also just do it by hand. It's the same thing. It just takes longer. But and your hands um, are, are well conditioned when you're done. They are. Yeah, because that lanolin, if, as long as you're not allergic to it, the lanolin's great for your hands. Um, and so here, I've been doing this over a white cloth here. And I'm just going to. Can you see this stuff that came off? Oh yeah. So just that one piece, that's how much came out. Goodness. So um, it does come out pretty easily. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty quick. So this is um, my first batch. <laughs> that first one I did. Um, this is what came out of, I don't know, like one evening's work-ish. So you can see that's, I mean, that's it's a lot, lot of stuff. Yeah, and in case it's, you know, looks creepy to anyone, um, the reason I keep it is because it's it's hard to see on camera, but it's mostly just dried grass. Mm -hmm. It's just pieces of dried grass. Um, I found some blackberry thorns. Um, I did find a couple of seeds and try and figure out what kind they were. They were <laughs> a little too desiccated for me to tell. Um, just little pieces of dried vegetable matter. I have found uh, some um, insect legs. When I was really looking close, I could tell some of them were insect legs. There was a, a dried up fly in one of them, but I mean, that's as gross as it gets with this. And it's all very dry by the time you do it because it's been sitting somewhere drying out for however long. So um, when they say vegetable matter, when I was first reading about it from modern felters, they're talking about VM. Oh, I got all the VM out. It's vegetable matter and it sounds horrifying until you realize it's, it's grass and blackberries. Right. Um, yeah, so now we're back to the period stuff for the Scythians. So once you've got this all 
um, usable in a usable state. This is, this is what happens next. So let me get this out of the way. So there's two ways um, you can do, let me back up before I tell you about those two ways. When you are looking at a piece of belt like this, so you see how thick this is? It's, that's, this is the thickness of a hat. Mm -hmm. So you can make different thicknesses and the thickness that you make depends a lot on the kind of wool that you're using. So mm. some wools are thicker um, and coarser. Some of them are finer. Sometimes you have mixes of different kinds together. The practical sort of pragmatic approach I take to it when I'm working with it is whatever wool I'm going to use, um, I literally weigh the hat that I want to make and I make sure I have at least that much prepped wool to work with. So I have a little... Um, what do you call it? Weigher thing. Scale. Scale. That's the word. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a little kitchen scale and I literally weigh the hat or the boots. If I have a pair like it already, I weigh them and I have a list of notes of like about how much it takes. Um, and then I make sure that I prep that much. Mm -hmm. You always need a little bit extra. So just like any project, make sure you have a little extra. Um, and then I take that wool and um I lay it out and I do it in layers and I make sure I use all of that wool. So with that said, I'm gonna show you how I lay it out and then I'll show you how we roll it. So this, I'm gonna point this down for a minute. So this is called mother felt. It's got a, it's even got a label cause I was doing something with it recently for a setup. Um, mother felt is an old piece of felt. So it's so old that um, it no longer has any fibers sticking up for anything else to stick to. So we can make the felt on top of the mother felt and it won't stick to this. So this piece in particular is a machine factory made wool felt. I bought it. I have not made enough felt pieces in large quantities to have an extra piece that I don't turn into something. <laughs> So I have tried it with a piece of my felt as a test. It, there's no difference that I can see between the bot stuff and um, the created stuff for the mother felt piece. Mm -hmm. So you can buy wool felt pre-made um, from a lot of craft stores. It's more expensive than buying the acrylic synthetic felt, craft felt. Yes. The craft felt works just the same way. So if you want to spend a dollar on a piece of craft felt to do this, you can. It doesn't change the outcome of the felt that you make. Awesome. It still works. So with my, my piece, um, this is the super duper technical process that we do. So the felt, is, you want to make sure it's at least the size of what you want to make. You want to make sure it's a little bit bigger than what your final felt piece needs to be because felt, when you make it, it shrinks a little bit. So this sample piece, um, I wanna fill the whole thing up for the piece I wanna make. So I put down, this is my just wad of felt. So I grab a handful and I put it down and I just put down on my hand and pull towards me and I work my way across and this is an incredibly forgiving craft. So as long as you've got felt happening or as long as you've got wool happening all the way across, you're fine. You don't have to stress out about being exactly the same because we'll work through that. So once I've got it all the way across, I go back and I overlap it. So I've got fibers going at least down to here. So I'm gonna overlap it again and go across so everything's overlapped, going the same direction. All right, so I'm gonna go all the way across and I'm gonna keep doing that, that same direction until I have the whole thing covered. I'm not gonna do that now to save time, but then I turn it and I get another piece of, felt, of wool that's prepped. And I'm gonna use a different color just so you can see the contrast. And this time I'm gonna go this direction because I want the, the wool to have as many different directions of contact as possible when I roll it. I'll show you rolling in a minute. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna do it that way. 
And I do that all the way across. All right, so then we've got two layers. And then I take my third batch and I'll use another color for this one. So then I go the next direction because we started here, so we did that way. Now we're gonna go this way. We do the same thing, we go all the way across. Just make sure it overlaps. And you keep going until it's all the way across. And when you're doing this, keep in mind that as you do these layers, there's going to be gaps because these are organic fibers. They have stretch. That's part of what makes felt wool cool. Mm -hmm. um, and by cool, I mean quite warm and resistant. Um, <laughs> but and yet it's super regulating. Right. So it, you're gonna have these voids. So we're gonna do, we do that all the way across. And when I do this, I always do at least three layers. So the more layers you have, the thicker it will get. I have found that three layers is the minimum to get a good felt from these, um, especially when I'm using the meat wool. I often will do four layers just to feel like it's gonna make a really solid, consistent felt. So this one's three layers, we're gonna say, three was enough for this project and this, this particular fiber. So once you've got it all laid out, the next thing you do, super scientific, literally take your hand and put it down and feel what it feels like. Mm -hmm. so, see, that part feels lower. So I'm gonna grab, this is why you need a little extra. And I literally just stick it in that hole and then feel it across and go, oh, there's that one's thin too. Put another piece in there and feel it. And when I do this, I will literally close my eyes and work my hands across and only open my eyes when I find a low spot and then I'll put it in. Because if I'm looking at it, my eyes distract from what's actually there. Because what you want is an even thickness all the way across. And when you put those little patch things in, it doesn't matter which way they go. It's okay if it's, you know, that last layer was that way and I just kind of stuck it in, that's okay because it's totally surrounded by all those other pieces. Um, the meat wool in particular has a lot more of those voids in them because it's, mm -hmm. um, it's less consistent than the stuff that's made for the fibers. So that's, that's how you lay it out. And then you use some super technical stuff. <laughs> um, not at all, it's not technical law. So, this, um, this mother felt, it serves two purposes. One is to tell you how big you want the piece to be. So you have some gauge for it. The other piece is to insulate what you're about to do. Because what it takes to make felt is heat and moisture and friction. You need all three of those things to make felt. So you can do that a bunch of different ways. So modern day, a lot of artisans will take super hot water like mm -hmm. near boiling water and they'll put it down and they'll massage it with their fingers. Um, and it uses lots and lots of water. And the thing that the Scythians did, the thing I think the Scythians did, because again, we don't have their written records, but it, this is also what's still being used today for people who are making um, gears and rugs. They're, this is the method they're using. Um, what they do is they take hot boiling water and for, a, so a gear, I'm gonna brief tangent. A gear is a, basically a yurt. So it's a big round um, living space. Mm -hmm. And it's made, the wall is made from one giant piece of wool felt. So it's like eight feet tall and well, I mean, how, how long it is depends on how big around your, your gear is. Right. And it's all one piece. So you make this huge uh, pile of sheep. Uh, wool and turn it all into one giant piece of felt right like 20 feet long single piece of felt outside so can you imagine trying to do it the modern day way where you do all of that water and then massaging it with your hands and you're making something that's like half an inch thick and like 20 feet long and eight feet wide that technique doesn't that is not reasonable for steps nomads for whom gathering water and gathering the
the fuel for fires is a very manual time intensive process. Mm -hmm. So what they do, they take that mother felt and for them when they're making gears, the mother felt is an old gear. It's a, it's a worn out piece of that wall and they build the new wall on top of it because then they know how big it needs to be, how long it needs to be, make it a little bit extra big and then do it. So they lay all this wool out and then one woman with a pot of water that big. So something holds, call it six cups of water, boiling water. She takes that pot and a stick that has a bunch of branches on it. So it kind of branches out like a broom does. Mm -hmm. um, and she pours the water over that, that stick and she walks backwards down the laid out wool and she flicks the water with that stick as she pours that pot of water and that pot of water will do for the entire gear. So hard to Doesn't believe. Do, yeah, it's, it's amazing. So all of that, so then you've got your heat and water, right? But that's exposed to the air. Right. And you need, you still need friction on all of that. So here's the two ways that um, I think they did it. So, and it's regional, modern day, it's regional, which one of these they use. And I have preferences for which one's easier to do. So okay. I'm going to tilt this back down. So there's the reed mat way. So you take a reed mat. And this is, um, this is literally just, a, this is a grass mat. Um, you can buy them easily modern day. You're looking for the kind of grass mats that people put against their back fence or that they use for um, sitting at the beach. So this is a, just a little piece of one. Um, and then you take your, your mother felt and your wool and you make a Swiss roll. So this is, bigger when you do a real one, but in my little model here, you literally are just rolling it up. Like that. And you've got a Swiss roll. And you take a piece of twine and you tie it into on either end and then you roll it. Literally roll it like a Swiss roll. And that oh. gives you the friction. So, Oh, and I got my little cord in there. <laughs> so really quick question. Yeah. When you're when you're doing a smaller scale like this and not an entire wall, um, are do you soak your wool before you do this or are you just kind of sprinkling? I'm I sprinkle it. And when I do it, I have um I have a little uh, hot water pot. Uh-huh. And um I use um I've tried a bunch of different things to spread the water, and the one that I like the most is a serving spoon that has the holes in it. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, they're sl slotted or they have decorative ones. Yeah. It's one of those serving spoons that has the holes in it. And I, I literally just pour, I, as soon as it says it's boiling, I take my little boiling kettle and I pour it and I flick it with the spoon across my project. It's sitting on my dining room table. Yeah. And it okay. uses about a half a cup of water for each one. Um, I think it could happen with less, but that is the, easy way to make sure I get enough right. um, across the whole project. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing you can do is if you've got, if you've got wool fiber that's being stubborn about felting, um, I also have a handy dandy spray bottle, modern spray bottle. And I add um, about a teaspoon of Dawn soap in, and the rest of this is filled with water and I mix it up and then I, I'll mist it across it and then I'll add the hot water on top of that. Um, it just helps the fibers separate a little bit better so that they can the scales can grab each other. Yeah. This is something they do modern day all the time. And again, um, most of the reason I do that is because I've washed out the lanolin and all of the other stuff because I've, I'm doing things that wouldn't be necessary if I was doing it in period. So it's an adaptation to making it easier modern day um theoretically if you get it hot and wet and you roll it for long enough with enough pressure it will felt i have seen videos of people doing that there's like villages where they do a big project of like making rugs um and it literally that it literally shows in all but one country it's all women in one country the men do it um but they literally sit and put their four ounce down on these rolls with the reeds and they put all the pressure on it and they roll it back and forth and they will roll it for four or five hours to make it felt. 
So it, it will work without using any soap, even, you know, modern day after we clean the wool and do all of that, um, the end product is not different. So, yeah, so there's the reed mat. Um, the other thing you can do is, um, I'm reaching behind me for my super fancy tools. So <laughs> this is a closet rod. Ooh. And this is a pool, well, this is a, pool noodles are commonly used. This is actually a uh, pipe insulation piece. So it's it's got a hole in the middle of it. Um, and I put it in there. So the other way you can do it is, and this one is what they use in the videos I found of people modern day making gears specifically, is they use this, instead of that reed mat, they put this in the center of the roll. So for this one, okay, let me grab a pencil so I can show you. So imagine this is your large rod of some variety. Um, and instead of that mat, they put down this and then they, roll mm -hmm. it that way. And when you're doing a gear, remember I was saying they're like 20 feet long. So imagine how big that this Swiss roll would be if it was for a gear. And they use a log for this. It's literally a log that sticks out both sides. And I found these videos. I love them so much. Um, they make these giant rolls and they wrap a tarp around them. One day they're using blue, um, blue tarps like we do for camping and then they tie these, these end pieces that stick out where it's the log. They tie a rope around both ends and then they tie, tie the ends of that rope to the back of a horse or a camel. Yes. And then in the two videos that I have where you can see the person who's taking the animal off to roll these, um, for the world, it looks like angsty teenagers being sent away by an angry parent. Like, go across the steps with the camel, don't come back until the felt is done. I mean, they're... <laughs> It, it's like universal facial expression. That's a parent and that's an angry teenager and they're being sent off to do a tour that's just somewhere else. Oh my goodness. I still I still want to do an Ontario West War or something like that with a herd of children and just make them go out you know, with a little harness or something and drag it through. <laughs> Daddy, I have them in teens. I actually think we could do it with dogs. Um, if we I got happy for you. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's the same thing. So the this rolled variety, um, you want that friction, right? So for this one, um, it's wrapped up in a tarp. So it's keeping all of the heat and the moisture in. And the mother felt is a fantastic insulator. So it's keeping, um, it does absorb a bunch of the water, but it also keeps all that heat in. So the log in the center is what's providing the friction in this case. So it's okay. every time you roll it, that log in the center, it's pushing down on the layers underneath it as it rolls. So that's where you're getting the friction from. So for this, this one, um, I find this one much easier to do, especially in the winter in my house, because there's no mess at all. Um, I roll it up on my, um, on my kitchen table mm -hmm. and I use, this is a $2 party um, uh, tablecloth. I found it on clearance after Halloween a couple years ago. So I cut it into the right size and right. this is what I roll it up in because that keeps all of the moisture in. Uh -huh. There's not much water there anyway, but that way it's completely contained. It keeps all the moisture in, it keeps all the heat in and it means when I have a roll like this, because when I'm doing a full size piece, this is this is the piece I'm using. It's about three and a half feet long. Mm -hmm. um, I put it on the floor and sit in a chair and give myself a foot massage and I roll it with my feet. And you don't I know, suffer. what's Sorry. that? I was gonna say, you don't suffer from plantar fasciitis all day. <laughs> no, because I, I get a nice foot massage whenever I do this. Um, so at the, it has two advantages. One of them is, yay, uh, I get a foot massage. Um, but also my toes tell me when it's time to add more hot water because as soon as the roll is cooler than my feet and it's no longer a pleasant warm foot massage, um, it's cool enough that I need to add more hot water so that it can continue felting because you need the heat with the water and the friction. Um, the other advantage of doing it this way, particularly with this roll, so this will 
this will work with just the rod. Um, you can also cover the rod with the pool noodle, but you don't have to. Um, this is a trick I picked up from somebody who does it modernly. The bounce gives it a little bit more friction. It lets things move a little bit more on the inside. So it just makes the felting quicker. But I did it um, for the first year I was doing this with just, just the rod as my you know pseudo tree trunk. And it right. works really well. The only difference is um, sort of how fast because you're getting a little bit more friction. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's this is an accessibility thing too. This means um, adding the pool noodle means that it takes a little bit less time. So if somebody has physical challenges, it's still doable um, with the pool noodle on it because it takes less time to actually have an effect and start getting the felt. Um, also with this one, you can do it with your feet. You can also do it on a table with your hands or your forearms. So anywhere that you can get a little bit of pressure down and roll it, uh, it'll work. So I, I like this method for um, the accessibility of it. The grass mat, um, this is great for the amount of friction that it gives. So you get the quick friction. Yeah. But you are stuck only going in two directions. So when you roll this one, these are, I mean, they're, they're reeds, right? So I can't roll it this yeah. way. I can only roll it this way or this way. And as you roll it, you want to change directions as you go. So the first time I'd roll it this way, and this is funny. So this, this stuff, because it's not sticking to each other, it's trying to wrap around the mother felt. When you get it wet, it, this won't happen because it's, <laughs> it starts sticking to itself. Right now it's just, um, it's all kinky and trying to flop around. So by the time you've done a first pass, it won't do that. So with this one, you can go this way and then this way. So when I do these, um, because you're working with friction and you're trying to get all these fibers to bind to each other, you want to give it friction in different directions to get a more consistent result. So with this one, I go this way, first roll. When it's cool, I add more hot water and then I'll go this way. And when it's cool, I'll add a little more hot water. And then I'll, by then it's a solid piece and I'll pick it up. And yeah, it's actually... Sorry to adhere to myself. Yeah. yeah. Then you flip it, flip it over, and then I'll do this way and this way. Okay. So that way you get different directions. Um, and I've tried it a bunch of different ways. It doesn't make much of a difference how many different directions you use, as long as you're using a couple of different directions. With the reed mats, it does matter that you flip it over because the top, this this side of it, yeah. Because of the way the friction is hitting it, it felts more. So you have to flip it so you get the consistency on the other side. Okay. When you're using this method, so you're going this way, as long as this um, dimension is longer than your longest piece, you can go this way. And if I, it's longer, then I can go this way, around this way, and then that way. So you just kind of work your way around and you don't have to flip it. So it turns into kind of a personal preference for which one you want to do. They both work. You just have to watch the felt and say, oh, it's not doing it as much in one space. Adjust the felt and then do it. Having said all of that, um, this is what it looks like as you go. So this, that's rolling at one time. You can see it's it's starting to become a piece of felt, right? It's still, I mean, you can see it's not even, but it's its starting to become a solid piece and it's its adhering to itself. Right. Uh, this is the second piece, it rolled twice. So it's not sturdy yet, but it's definitely felt. And you can already see that's, that's how thick it is. And it's not even. So you can see sort of on this side, you can see there's, there's a piece there that's um, not as thick as the pieces down here. By three times, it's pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. And it's not as sturdy as I want it to be, but it's it's definitely felt. And that's the fourth time. So it's consistent and you can see, so here's twice 
This one's twice, that one's four times. And you see it got thinner and uh, more consistent. Dang, it. Well, amazing. <laughs> and then you have felt. Yeah, that's incredible. So uh, once you have felt, it will shrink. The amount it shrinks depends on the kind of fiber it is. So I just kind of plan on it having to be about 20% bigger than what I want. And sometimes it's bigger than that, but those pieces turn into embellishments later. So you're not wasting it. Excellent. You just don't throw them away. They turn into something that you like, um, oops, turn my sleeve. So like this, this is the kind of thing that you make out of, for the Scythian garb, you make this out of scraps. You're never gonna waste those extra bits. So make it a little bigger. Um, and then when you wanna dye them, I like dyeing it after the felt is made. Okay. Um, if you dye the, the wool before you make the felt, you will get something like this. And see how this looks a lot like our unprocessed wool. <laughs> you have to fluff it up again. So you're gonna have to recomb it some amount, even though you already did it to clean it. So I much prefer making the felt and then dyeing it because then I have to do this twice. Uh, functionally, there's no difference that I can see in the kind that I've been doing. Um, yeah, the dye goes in just as well after as it does before. Um, and a lot of dyes, period dyes, are plants that are edible. So for instance, this is onion. Excellent. So this is safe to do in your kitchen pots. You don't have to buy a whole dyeing set of things. Oh, somebody asked a question. It says, hyperbolic <laughs> questions. If you need mother felt to make felt, where did the first felt come from? <laughs> uh, it, it came from somebody doing it on a rock or a piece of leather. Or actually, I do know the probable answer to it. Uh, it probably came from somebody stuffing wool into their boots to insulate their feet. And as they walked around, it created felt. That's, that's the best guess right now for who figured out the first piece of felt. Right. Probably they plucked wool off of, um, because sheep used to um, shed sort of constantly yeah. instead of being having it be cut from them. So they picked those things off. They figured out, hey, this is warm, shoved it in their shoes, and then walked around on it. And the um, heat and sweat and the friction of walking would make felt. And you would have this perfectly shaped, warm, insulating thing. So came from shoes and foot sweat. <laughs> Um, so a lot of dyes, uh, are not food safe and you don't want to do them in your kitchen stuff, things that you're going to make your food out of, but a lot of them you absolutely can do. You just have to be mindful of it. So onions, this is yellow onions, super inexpensive, super easy. You literally take the yellow onion skins off, boil them, and then put your wool in and it'll turn this sort of golden color. Um, I have a collection sitting on the on the counter, so. <laughs> it, it works great. And you literally put the wool in and um, in the hot water, you uh -huh. let it come back up to temperature and then you turn the heat off, put the lid on and walk away overnight. And it will absorb all of the dye, the wool will um, absorb all of the dye that it can out of the onions. And by the next morning, it, it'll, the, if you have um, few enough onions, it will have absorbed all of the onion dye and you'll have clear water again which is also super cool to watch. It, it's called yeah. exhausting the dye. Yes. Yeah, it's, I love it. It's one of my coolest um, uh, things that I learned about this when I started doing it, was watching the water just get cool, get clear again overnight. No. Um, this one's turmeric. Oh. So it's this great golden color. Um, I've done it a couple of different ways. So I've used the turmeric root because I'm in Portland, I can get fresh root into it. But I also did it with powdered turmeric out of a jar from the spice area. It works the same. There's no difference in the color that I got. Um, oh. And it seems to be just as color safe. So I've treated it a couple of different ways. And um, I haven't had any of them change color over the last like two years. Um, so yeah, turmeric. It's such a lovely color too. What's that? It's such a lovely golden color too. Yeah, it's a great color. Yeah. And then this is the other one. So. This is um, Kool-Aid. <laughs> yes. So this is totally food safe. Um, you want to use sugar-free because you don't want sugar in your felt. 
right. you, you can, you can wash it out, but it, it will come out sticky and you'll have to wash it. Uh, don't stick it in a wash machine or a dryer. Don't ever do that. No, no, no. Um, but this is, yeah, this is just Kool-Aid. And just for context, so this is matter. Um, yes. This is a period dye. This is one of the ones that you shouldn't do in your uh, kitchen pots, but it makes this great dark color. So this is the Kool-Aid. So this is cherry Kool-Aid. Um, I keep meaning, I, I need to get back to this. I haven't had a chance yet. Um, I think the cherry Kool-Aid, two packets of cherry with one packet of blueberry sugar-free would make this color. Cause this is just bright cherry. It just needs some blue to kind of chill it out. Um, yeah. So you can mess around with those colors and uh, not poison yourself. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, so these are the hats that came out. So this is one of my early hats and I like showing people this because see how the dye didn't come out evenly. Mm -hmm. um, this is, this was done with matter and this is where I didn't get all of probably the lanolin out when I was washing it from that really messy meat wool. Mm -hmm. um, Cause it, it's these like weird patches and it's across all of it. So something didn't get cleaned out of the wool enough to make this even. And it's still a totally functional hat. And the light that I'm under is really showing where those uneven dyes are. It's still a totally wearable hat. It doesn't yeah. look bad from three feet away. Um, it doesn't look bad close up. It's just from about three feet away, you can't tell it's uneven. The halogen's really showing it off right now. Um, so it's, there's no downside to trying it out. You don't lose yeah. anything if the dye doesn't do what you expected. You can always also over dye it with RIT if you hate it, because RIT dyes, not period, but very accessible, easy to find. And if while you're trying new stuff, you go, I hate that. Um, you can do period dyes to correct it, or you can go, you know what? I want a finished piece that I can wear. Modern dyes are awesome. Um, this, is coconut oil. Yes. So this piece, you can see the dye is way more even. It went into the wool more evenly. Um, so I didn't have that issue with the lanolin in it. So it, you know, learning process, right? Right. Nobody does it perfectly the first time, every time. Um, and then this is, this is doing um, half felted stuff. So this one doesn't have any dye in it. This is different colors of sheep's wool. Um, and I made these things, I did that rolled, I rolled it once enough to have it stick together in these little rondelles. And then I stuck it on another piece that had only been rolled once and then they felt together like this. Nice. So this half felting thing is also a very period way to get designs and patterns in and you can yeah. just play with them and they work because this is this was my first experiment. I didn't know what would happen. I just read about this being possible. Yeah, it's just felting. It's super forgiving. Um, and oh, about it being a really forgiving craft. Um, when you do this this um, Swiss roll process and you have to roll it four or five times, I usually not have to do it four times. Now, um, one of the things I learned was this mother felt. Um, if it gets cold, it will wick the heat out of all of the felt inside and it will cease to felt. So okay. that's one of the reasons if you do it outside on a hot day, felting can happen faster because it won't get cold when it's wicked. Mm -hmm. um, but if you roll it up in something that holds the heat and the water in, uh, it will work anywhere. It doesn't matter what temperature it will. If it's freezing cold, it'll, it won't work, but it'll stay warm and you'll be able to make the felt. So it doesn't have to be a hot summer day. Um, it doesn't have to be outside. I do 99% of mine inside. And if I mess up and I let this mother felt get cold and it's wicking away all the heat, it literally will take the half done felt off. I'll set it on the table. And I'll take this mother felt that's soaking wet and freezing cold and I'll either toss it on a drying rack, I'll just leave it overnight and let it dry, or I'll toss it in the dryer and let it tumble because it's um, synthetic or rather it's uh, manufactured, it won't actually shrink in the dryer. 
Mm -hmm. um, but as soon as it's dry, then I can put my piece of felt back on it and just keep going. There's no, there's no ruining. It's not ruined. You can just keep going. I've also gotten interrupted halfway through, stopped with the Swiss roll and walked away from it for a week because I got involved in other things, mm -hmm. came back, unrolled it, added hot water, rolled it up and just kept going. It, I love it. <laughs> it can genuinely be picked up. It's super, super forgiving. Yeah. You don't have to do things, things all together. They did them and do them all together in big batches because it's a big batch processing piece, not because mm -hmm. the chemistry or the physics of this requires it. That is, which also I means <laughs> if you wear out and you're exhausted, you can just stop and come back to it when you feel better. That's which is wonderful. I love about it. So, yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, that's amazing. Are, so, are you planning on doing any rondelles on hats anytime soon? Um, <laughs> no, but I might have signed up for a class with somebody who's teaching the traditional way of doing it in Kyrgyzstan for making the full on rugs this summer. So, I'll get to share how to do all of that. And it's all based on that half felt thing. And she makes these amazing patterns with them. And it's from the region the Scythians were in. It's it's a modern day one, but this is, yeah, it's an ancient craft that um, I'm super excited to get some details for because the level of detail that she teaches people how to make is amazing. So yep. we're having a disagreement between my dogs now. So. <laughs> Oh, that's, yeah, I'm whoa, looking forward to, uh, sorry, the old lady dog has decided that the puppy has overstepped her bounds. So. Uh, she has to be told. <laughs> well, yes, and rightly so, frankly. But um, no, I'm really looking forward to hearing what, what you come back with from that class, because I I know I, one of the one of the videos I, I dug up um, a couple of years ago was of a rug maker and the patterning that they that they it's do amazing. is beautiful. Yeah, it's uh, and so it and for what seems like a blunt instrument craft, uh, it, you know, it seems like you know you're not doing fiddly little tiny things to make the perfect lines and the you know exact. Yeah, that's it, that's part of why I'm so excited about this class because I have I thought those rugs were sewn and this this whole variety that she's going to teach us it's a whole week long class it's not sewn it's all felted and they are these really fine lines all the way through all of them so i'm super excited to see how how they do that oh that's going to be so awesome and i don't mean i should i don't mean blunt instrument in like an offensive way at all i i yeah it's just it's it's a really forgiving craft it's it's yeah. very very forgiving oh that's so awesome um, I'm trying to think, did I have, oh, you don't know. I didn't say any of my questions out loud if I had them. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, open, open this, excuse, excuse me. <laughs> someone, someone has uh, trained the dog to jump on the couch. I do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was trying to think if there's anything else that I, oh, um, the Scythian hat in particular, if anyone is, wants to make a Scythian hat, the pattern for it is something I can send over the internet so they can um, email me and I can send it to them. It's um, it's based on some geometry and I have the directions for, it just takes a ruler and a pencil. So mm -hmm. um, the way I make these, so this is, this is a um, straight from the pattern and so the pattern's too big on purpose because people's heads are different dimensions and people want different amounts of um, like shade in the front or like their ears to be covered or not covered. So the pattern is sort of the generic oversized variety. And then you put it on somebody's head and you trim it to exactly the dimensions they want. Mm -hmm. So it's a really forgiving, like one size fits all, genuinely one size fits all because you put it on and then you trim it to fit exactly what they want. So like, Mine, I don't want my ears covered. Makes me crazy to have my ears covered. Um, so I mine's trimmed back a little bit further, just in the arc on the side. Um, and other people, they like they want these to be longer or shorter. So it's all customizable, and you literally just put it on and have somebody trim it for you. So oh, anybody wants awesome. the pattern, I can send it. Okay, excellent. And are are these? Are you sewing the seams closed like a standard sewing? Oh yeah. 
Um, yeah, it's um, it's a baseball stitch. It's okay. literally a baseball stitch. And um, in period, I know they had a seam here. Um, I haven't found anything that shows me what seam they had on the hats that look like this. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that it's something that butts it up against the edge, but I don't have like the pictures that would show me exactly what kind of seam treatment they had. Um, and they weren't showing these off because there's some Scythian stuff where they show off the seams and they make them into a big, like, you know, um, yeah. how you do contrast and color and you're showing off a seam. Um, these hats didn't have that in any of the ones I found. So I'm just joining them in a unobtrusive way. Okay. Um, and okay. Yes. See, now I'm thinking about the boots. And so the boots are... Okay, the boots are a whole different thing. Do you want right. do you want to go down the boot rabbit hole tonight? Well, I don't move. Hmm. It is eleven minutes after, so I yeah. don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> um, we can also do the boots another time because those those are a whole. You make the felt first, and then there's a whole thing to making the boots. Oh goodness. Okay. See now now I want to know, but we'll have to. Yes, we'll have to, have to talk about that another time. It's um, not really complicated for for the wearable boots. So. Hmm. I need boots. <laughs> Sorry, I was directed at the, the the person that would get dragged into all of the, you know, the work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you. I I do find this so fascinating. I love I love it when there's the thread of the thread through history from the we know that it would have looked similar to what is Sorry, to, to what is going on now and how, how these things are made now. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I have a puppy. Would you like a puppy? No. I'm sure. Nope. I, I have enough. <laughs> she would really love to drag that roll everywhere and lick it and chew on it. And, and, oh. That first one sounds good, but the other two are, are less productive. And yeah, I think we could um, actually rig one up to have a dog drag it and we could actually see what it looks like when it's dragged in that kind of roll. We just need to scale it down from like camel size, which yeah, is pretty yeah. large. Oh, Robert Fraser just commented and said, this will give me something to do with that sheep. <laughs> yes. Yes. yes Robert, they have, they have a lot of livestock, so uh, I'm sure there will be an evil plan involved. Um, but yes, it's, I, oh man, it's such a, it's such a, huh, sorry. I just, it's such a, delightful area of study there's so much to um to look at and and oh, yeah. find don't you dare chew my tunic oh my goodness okay it's a, it's kind of a never-ending rabbit hole too because it's so and anywhere that has sheep has felt i mean yeah. it's just so pragmatic and it's useful in so many ways and yeah yeah and you get all yeah. the colors and the textures and all the different things you can do with it and yeah ah I have questions about the use of felt in Andalusia now. I'll have to check. That out. <laughs> yes, we should talk about that later. We should. I'll have to find that. Oh goodness. Well then, I I will because otherwise I will start to dither. Um, unless you had a, something. Oh, seriously, do you want a puppy? Just would yeah. anyone like a Great Pyrenees puppy? She's lovely. Lovely. <laughs> She's very pretty. She <laughs> is. Somebody else's. <laughs> she is very pretty. <laughs> Um, but yeah, thank you again for, for, for introducing me to this to begin with. I, I have, yes, it's so enjoyed going down the rabbit hole the first time I did and also today. So one of these days, one of these days I will harness the child and the puppy and, um, send them out with a roll of felt. Let's do it. Yes. I love this plan. Well, on that note, then we'll go ahead and, um, wrap up. Thank you everyone for joining us. And um, thank you, Baroness yeah. Vivian. Oh, goodness. Thank you. Nothing is Have happening. Evening, everybody. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>